Well, thanks very much. I always feel slightly guilty at the beginning of a show because you all clapped and whooped. I've done nothing so far. I just walked from over there. It was easy. Anyone could have done it. You could have done it. Maybe not you, but most of <laughs> most people could have done it. I always feel quite guilty because you've given so much, I've done so little. What if I'm shit? <laughs> Don't panic, I'm not. <laughs> Close to comedy genius. <laughs> the Guardian. <laughs> it's a newspaper for teachers, I don't expect you to understand. <laughs> I am Jimmy Carr, off the telly. I know that because people come up to me and say, Jimmy Carr, off the telly. <laughs> that tends to be less a description, more of a request. <laughs> Fine. Swimming's good for you, especially if you're drowning. <laughs> Not only do you get a cardiovascular workout, you also don't die. <laughs> Two ticks. I said to my girlfriend, I said, uh, you shouldn't eat before you go swimming. She said, why? I said, you look fat. <laughs> I've got a friend whose nickname is Shagger. You might think, that's pretty cool. She doesn't like it. <laughs> you know those anti-AIDS red ribbons? You don't see so many around these days, do you? That is, I think, because these so-called anti-AIDS ribbons actually offer no protection. <laughs> you think you're upset? I found out from a bloke in the gents. <laughs> Do you realise that last joke makes me sound a little bit gay? I'm not. I realise I'm wearing the kind of shirt that's often lifted. <laughs> but I'm not. My own mum thought I was gay. When I was 19, my mum was convinced I was gay. It's very difficult to convince your mum you're not gay. Until we got a camcorder, I was fucked. <laughs> But I'm what's referred to as a gay-friendly act, you know? I'm a gay-friendly act. I was asked last November to judge Mr Gay UK. I said it would be my pleasure. He's against nature and against God and he's going to hell. <laughs> I think it's okay to tell that joke because it's almost impossible to offend a homosexual man. You know, because let's face it, if they're doing that for fun... If your idea of a good time is a cock in your ass, what do you care? <laughs> We've all thought about gay sex, though, haven't we? You've, you've thought about gay sex, haven't you, sir? No. You haven't thought about gay sex. You just leapt in there and fucked him. <laughs> well, I admire your honesty, sir, and your bravery. I thought about gay sex. I thought, oh, my cock will get covered in poo. <laughs> You're sniggering. What's your name, long lady? Who... <laughs> Move along. <laughs> what are you saying, Vicky? Dance for me, monkey boy. <laughs> Is he your fella? What do you mean? He's either your fella or he isn't. Is he, is he your fella? Yeah. Sorry, she's saying yes, and you're saying no, and you just look, you've gone really red and you look really embarrassed. They're fuck buddies. Oh! I see what, how very modern. Very 2005, so you're not going out with each other, but you are fuck buddies. <laughs> that is fantastic. Can we just all take a moment to, you know, congratulate that man there? <laughs> He's, a lot of work has gone into that. A lot of work has gone into that. He's had to buy a Cosmopolitan for a couple of years. <laughs> Sorry? And they'll know that you're a dead little hussy. <laughs> The great thing about that is that he's convinced you that, yeah, we don't need a relationship. It's so... 
It's so old-fashioned. I should be able to sleep with whoever I want to sleep with. And so should you, as long as it's just me. <laughs> when I say... <laughs> Yeah, there'll be a lot of jokes. <laughs> it's not every day I get to talk to a slag. Come on. <laughs> now... I don't know where the mark is until I overstep it. That's my... <laughs> you just did. <laughs> that is juvenile. That... Sorry. For those of you that didn't see that, it'll be on the DVD. <laughs> Available at all good car boots. <laughs> Vicky's response to that... Yeah, she's been called a slag at a show. That's not good in anyone's book, and I apologise for that unreservedly. But did you really need to do that? <laughs> God bless you. I was doing a gig a couple of weeks ago. I got talking to a girl down the front and asked her where she was from. She said, I'm from outside Birmingham. <laughs> I said, really? So am I. What part of Birmingham aren't you from? <laughs> at what point, and really I'm asking the men, at what point do you get paranoid about receiving enlarge your penis emails? <laughs> it's not just me getting them, is it? It's just I'm currently getting about ten a day. Eight of them are from my girlfriend. <laughs> the two from my mum that really hurt. <laughs> It's a rather pitying look you're giving me there, madam. I, I don't need your pity, frankly. I'm not particularly well hung, but I don't mind admitting that. I'm not embarrassed or ashamed, because I know that any woman that thinks being well hung is important is just shallow. <laughs> Maybe that's not quite the right term to use. <laughs> I broke up with a girl once because she lied about her weight. I say that, she died in a bungee jumping accident. <laughs> see because she was heavier than she... <laughs> Has anyone got anything he could be colouring in? <laughs> you look like some kind of surfer dude. Who, what's your name? John. John? Where are, you, where are you from, John? The United States. Well done. <laughs> John, do you know the difference between a British soldier and an Iraqi soldier? <laughs> And what do you do, John? What, what are you doing over here? I don't need to check your papers. I'm just checking, you know, <laughs> just asking. I'm a college professor on vacation. You're a college professor on vacation. <laughs> okay, sounds like a setup for a movie. <laughs> With hilarious consequences. <laughs> and then he asked me for a fag. Oh. <laughs> Fanny? I thought he meant bum. Oh. <laughs> Yes. So, what, what do you teach? I teach philosophy and religious studies. Philosophy and religious studies. <laughs> well done. So, <laughs> do you teach philosophy to the brighter kids, and then if they don't get the hang of it, you go, oh, I just believe in God, don't matter. <laughs> well, I'll tell you why I've asked you all to come this evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'd like to talk to you about men that like obese women. I'm not talking about men that like women with a fuller figure. That seems entirely normal, natural and right. More cushion for the pushing, as I believe people say. <laughs> I think that's the expression. No, I'm talking about men that like women who are... can't leave the house fat. <laughs> so, I'm not talking about anyone in here this evening. Unless, in order to get out, someone had to cut the side of the house off. <laughs> and there was some sort of winch involved. I'm not talking about people with water retention. I'm talking about people with cake retention. <laughs> people that tell you they've got a thyroid problem. You say, oh, really, a thyroid problem? What are you taking for that? Pies? <laughs> you know, the kind of girl that looks as if she makes a cracking breakfast. But wouldn't want to share it with you. <laughs> I saw a thing on TV the other day, actually. It was on one of these kind of makeover shows that were on during the day. They did a makeover on a girl. She was 34 stone. It's like rearranging the deck chairs on the Titanic. <laughs> I say a makeover, they gave her a fringe. Is that really going to turn the corner for a girl like that? That's what I'm asking. I don't think it will. 
I can't imagine a scenario where a guy, you know, he's drinking in a bar, he looks across, he sees a girl, she's 34 stone, be tough to miss her, let's face it. <laughs> he thinks to himself, she's a little bit big for me. Goes back to his drink. Meanwhile, the makeover team are in. Snip, snip, snip. <laughs> he looks back, he thinks, actually, I would. <laughs> it's the excuses that get me. The excuses are amazing. The camera adds ten pounds. Stop eating fucking cameras. <laughs> The reason I've become obsessed by this topic is because of a couple of documentaries on TV. There's one called Fatties and Their Feeders. Did anyone see it? Yeah. It's an amazing sociological study of obesity in our country and the health problems inherent in that. And also, it was fucking hilarious. <laughs> it was basically these tiny little stick-thin men bringing massive KFC buckets of food to these enormous women that couldn't even move. And while we're on the subject, do be careful with the KFC bucket. It's a big leap from plate to bucket. <laughs> but from bucket to trough, <laughs> not very far at all. The other one that was on was called Chubby Chasers. I like the title, Chubby Chaser. Sounds great. I just wonder how accurate is that? How much chasing is actually going on? <laughs> a little bit of waddling and wheezing. <laughs> then gotcha. Gotcha. The male gypsy moth can smell the female gypsy moth up to seven miles away. And that fact also works if you remove the word moth. <laughs> There's a lot of cliches about gypsies. Maybe you can help me out with this, sir. <laughs> Have you ever tarmac to drive? No. no, of course not. You just take the deposit and fuck off like the rest of them. <laughs> You've been what, say? You've block paved a few. You've block paved a few. Yes. yes. You see, to my mind, that would be the same thing. <laughs> I love the fact you've made a distinction. <laughs> I have a tarmac to drive? No, I've block paved a few, but I, I can't imagine that's what he's getting at. <laughs> What's your name? Lee. Lee. Hello, Lee. Hello, Jimmy. <laughs> it's like a love. Yeah, nice to meet you, Lee. <laughs> No, it's, it's lovely to have you in. You seem to have taken that in the right way. I did that joke at a gig a couple of weeks ago. See, when I do that joke, I've got to pick on someone from the audience. So what I do is I look around quickly and I pick on someone who looks like a bikey. <laughs> Not a problem. Anyway, I did this joke in South End. Yeah, I picked on a big guy down the front. He was laughing along with everything. He took it slightly the wrong way. Really, like, properly insulted. Came up to me after the show and threatened me. But he was pretending to be a lot posher than he was. Because he was saying, well, I'm not a gypsy, so he's pretending to be really posh. And he tried to threaten me without swearing. That's a tough thing to do. He used the phrase, knuckle sandwich. <laughs> and then he said, rather epically, do you like hospital food? <laughs> no, I didn't say anything because I was a little bit afraid. On reflection, of course, I should have said, I'm with Booper, it's delicious. <laughs> I've got a choice of three starters. Do your fucking worst. <laughs> oh, sorry, Lee, I've labelled you a chav. I didn't mean to. I quite like the term chav. I, I read it in the papers before I heard it out loud. I thought it was pronounced Shav. <laughs> I should want... Don't kick off, Lee. I'm middle class, but I'm hard. <laughs> Al dente, you might say. <laughs> if you got the al dente reference, you're middle class too. Well done. Things I, I genuinely really, really like gypsies. I've got some Romany blood in me on my mother's side, and I think it's an alternative lifestyle, but I think it's a good one. And the people that don't like gypsies, they're always saying, oh, yeah, these travelling people, you've got to move them on. Isn't that playing into their hands? <laughs> right, well, we've done fat girls and gypsies. Religion. I used to be quite religious, and I'm fascinated by lots of religious groups. There's, um, there's some brilliant ones. There's the, um, the people that wear the armbands, WWJD. Stands for What Would Jesus Do? And Christians wear them to remind them to be more like Christ in everyday life. They sort of see that and they're, oh, what would Jesus do in this situation? Yeah. For the most part, they're very effective. They make people so annoying, you want to nail them to a cross. <laughs> 
My other, my absolute favourite Christian organisation of all time, it's called Christians Against Teenage Pregnancies. That's the Everest of hypocrisy, isn't it? If Jesus taught us nothing else, he taught us that the unwanted babies of teenage mums can turn out all right. <laughs> you look as if you didn't quite understand that. Do you know who the protagonist is? It's Jesus. Born at Christmas or Easter. You must have heard of him. <laughs> King of the Jews. Best Jew ever. He could walk on water. Well, he probably couldn't walk on water. His mum probably just exaggerated. He was probably very good on ice skates. <laughs> he died for your sins. Come. <laughs> I said to my girlfriend, I said, on Saturday, how would you like to go shopping with the girls, get yourself some new shoes, get your hair done in a different style, and then go out for a couple of bottles of Chardonnay? She said, that sounds brilliant. I said, good, because we're breaking up. <laughs> You know when a man says to you, it's not you, it's me? Ladies, you know when a man says that? It's not you, it's me. We mean that from the heart. That's not bullshit. That's true. It's just a fragment of a longer phrase. It's not you, it's me that's ending this relationship. <laughs> because I can't stand the fucking sight of you. <laughs> you know when people argue just so as they can make up again? Call me cynical. I don't think that's what's going on in the Middle East. John Merrick, the elephant man, he was cruelly taunted all the way through his life. John Merrick was cruelly taunted all the way through his life. People said to him, you're the ugliest man in the world. But he didn't mind. Very thick-skinned. <laughs> Does anyone know how John Merrick died? Anyone? In his sleep. In his sleep? Are you getting death mixed up with sleeping? <laughs> you don't write gravestones for a living, do you? Not dead, just sleeping. Well, dig him up, then. <laughs> He'll be fucking livid. <laughs> I know what you mean, though, because it's in the film and they take away a pillow and then it, people with elephant heads can't lie flat, as we all know. <laughs> yeah, if you like, why not? It's only a film. That's only a film, not actually how it happened. Any other suggestions as to how he died? Wanking. <laughs> he died wanking. <laughs> I don't know if you can die wanking. <laughs> Hang on, I'll ask. <laughs> can you die with E? <laughs> He's still here. <laughs> that is a good response. <laughs> <laughs> still here. I've had some great suggestions recently from the audience. Um, too many sticky buns. <laughs> Be a great way for the elephant man to go. Another person said, a somewhat ironic allergy to peanuts. <laughs> Someone suggested poachers. <laughs> it's a long shot. Kiltree's ivory. <laughs> yeah, it's a shame he's gone, but a lovely chess set. <laughs> no, what actually happened was a bearded lady shot a dwarf out of a cannon <laughs> and it landed on his elephant head. Freak accident. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> Has anyone here been to Alton Towers? Yes. What do you think? Do you enjoy it? I enjoyed it. Yeah, yeah it's great. Shit. shit. <laughs> Go on, who was that? It was you? Did you have a shit time? It was awful. My God. <laughs> Tell me more. You ro the, sorry, the best thing about Alton Towers was, we robbed a fruit machine. <laughs> that is an amazing sentence. <laughs> sorry, sir, your time as the gypsy this evening is now... <laughs> now over. That is... Forget it. Forget it. You have been out-chaved. <laughs> well, to, well, you went to Alton Towers and your complaint was, not enough to nick. I love the way you're using now an expression of yeah, you rob a fruit, you see a fruit machine, you rob a fruit machine. <laughs> come on, we're friends, we all come on. You know I'm a guy, you're a guy, we steal things from fruit machines. <laughs> no! <laughs> What's your name, sir? Daniel. Daniel. Well, nice to meet you, Daniel. What do you do? I work at a jeweler's in Bunchy. <laughs> <laughs> 
unless you're the cleaner, <laughs> they've made a massive error of judgment. <laughs> so how long have you been casing this joint? <laughs> About a year. And when's the big job? <laughs> this is great. Do I get paid extra if this ends up on Crime Watch? <laughs> Well, I liked Alton Towers. I thought it was good. I thought, you know, Alton Towers is good. Who thought it was good? Yeah. Yeah, yeah it's all right. It's like a poor man's Disney. <laughs> sort of place you might send a child who's dying of something that isn't that serious. <laughs> What's he got? Asthma? We'll have a whip round. I'm making no promises. <laughs> Brittle bones? Brittle bones. <laughs> Has he been to Chessington? <laughs> He'll have to bring his own cat, yep. <laughs> The reason I mention Norton Towers is they've got a ride that they've been advertising on TV again. It's a vertical drop roller coaster. Correct me if I'm wrong, that's a lift. <laughs> hmm. um, right, good. Any questions so far? How old? What? How old? How old? Yeah, fuck grammar, we're in a hurry. <laughs> is that? <laughs> how old? <laughs> Not how old are you or would you mind telling us how old you are? How old? 28. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, well, have a guess. How old do you think I am? You think I'm 12? <laughs> well, you shouldn't even be having those kind of thoughts about me, then. <laughs> Do you know they've done that in Mexico? Do you know what the age of consent is in Mexico? It's 12. That's one way to deal with a paedophilia problem, isn't it? <laughs> I imagine they've still got a problem. She looked 12 to me. I didn't always used to do this for a living. I used to work for an oil company. It was the same sort of thing. It was telling lies to strangers. <laughs> but that was a bit more awkward. That was much more, yeah, don't worry about Nigeria. That'll be fine. <laughs> <laughs> when I did used to work for a living, I was always very jealous of the women that I worked with because women have the best excuse for a day off sick. I love a day off sick. Marvellous. Duvet, very nice and comfy. Mm. <laughs> and women have the best excuse. The best excuse, as we all know, is women's problems. And the reason women's problems is the best excuse is because women's problems is the end of a conversation. <laughs> Why didn't you come in yesterday? Women's problems. <laughs> I like to think if I was the boss, things would be slightly different. Women's problems. Tits or fanny? <laughs> Which is it? Maybe I could have a look. I suppose I, I should really tell you a little bit about myself. Um, before I do, can I just ask, are you two there? You look quite young. How old are you? 18. You're 18? Yeah. Are you? Yeah. Really? Yeah. Are you adding six years to your age? <laughs> because you think I might be a fucking idiot? <laughs> You're 18. Yeah. But you've got a growth hormone <laughs> problem, some description. <laughs> Not even. You're genuinely 18. Yeah. Forgotten how young an 18 year old boy looks like. <laughs> is that a bad thing to say? It's quite bad, isn't it? And your boyfriend, how old is he? <laughs> what? It's my brother. It's your brother? Yeah. Well, don't shag him then. <laughs> I noticed that your, your shirt, is that a fashion thing? It looks like it's covered in spunk. <laughs> No, honestly, on a, stand up and turn around. It's an amazing show. It's probably... What? Come on. Look at that! Right. It's, it's quite a cool design when you look at it closely, but if you just glance at it, it looks like a plasterer's radio. <laughs> that is a term used in the dogging fraternity, I believe. <laughs> I was out the evening with Stan Collymore. I drove away with a car looking like a plasterer's radio. <laughs> well, I should, I suppose, you know, 
talk about myself a little bit. I grew up in Slough in the 1970s. If anyone wants to know what Slough was like in the 1970s, go there now. <laughs> Actually, I went back recently. There's a sign as you drive in. It says Slough, twinned with Montreux. I'll tell you this much. They're not identical twins. <laughs> There's no chance of getting those mixed up. In fact, the only thing you need to know about Slough is one sign that we've got at the end of the high street. We've got one tourist information sign. Most towns of any note have many. We've just got the one. You know the ones that say, you are here. We've got one that says, you are here, but someone's added a question mark. <laughs> so it now reads, you are here. <laughs> Your travel agent is a cunt. <laughs> <laughs> I was educated in Cambridge University. Well, done. well ooh, that's not an uncommon response. People think because you went to Cambridge, you're a little bit smug, a little bit up yourself. Not the case. The only reason I went to Cambridge is because I got four A's at A-level. <laughs> of course, the only reason I got four A's at A-level is because when I was at school, I didn't have that many friends, and, you know, I didn't have a girlfriend, certainly, and so no one would have sex with me. I used to go home every night like a good little boy and do my homework. Yeah. So next time you meet someone who's a bit over-educated and pompous, don't think to yourself, God, they're intimidating. Think, no good with a poontang. I got my big break in show business doing the Royal Variety performance a couple of years ago. It's quite a good gig, but then I had to meet Prince Charles afterwards, and that was a bit awkward. Because, you know, what do you say? I didn't know what to say to him. He didn't know what to say to me, you know. But he managed to cobble something together. That's his job, isn't it? Other than waiting for his mum to die. <laughs> he cobbled something. He said, he said, very funny indeed, very good dead pannery. Now, we all know dead pannery is not a real word. <laughs> But it's his mum's English, she can say what he fucking likes. <laughs> the great thing about being on TV a little bit is you get asked to do interesting things. I was asked last year to go on Countdown. I couldn't believe my luck. I thought, brilliant, I'll definitely do that. Because I've always had a thing for Carol Waterman. I've always liked her. Not just because she's fit. No. Also for her mind. <laughs> Although that's not what I tend to say. I tend to say I wouldn't mind fucking her brains out. <laughs> Think about it, take ages. <laughs> I shall, um, I shall tell you a story uh, about something else that happened because, I, I, you know, I'm a little bit on telly now and people phone up and they ask, they ask you to do interesting things. I was asked about three years ago to write a journalistic piece for the first time. I was really excited. A Sunday paper phoned up, they said, would you like to write a piece for us? I immediately agreed. And as a conversation went on, it transpired it was a piece for the motoring section called My First Crash. <laughs> I think I would have said no, but I'd already said yes earlier in the conversation. So, you know, what do you do? I said, I said, yeah, okay, fine. And in the end, I was quite pleased with what I wrote. I wrote about sort of, you know, 250 words on my first crash. I said, my first, well, what happened was I went on a driving holiday, flew into Barcelona, rented a car, went around Spain, Portugal, France, just staying in sort of three-star hotels and B&Bs and just kind of hanging around, yeah? And, uh, and the idea was we would end up driving back to Paris, get the Eurostar back, you know, go first class, be quite exciting. It only just opened, so it was quite an exciting thing. We slightly mistimed it. So we're kind of late getting back into Paris. This is the days before, you know, sat nav. So we've got maps out. We're trying to work out how Paris is, you know, trying to, you know, it's a complicated city to get round. You know, it's late at night. We, we just, we got cut up by loads of guys on scooters. Just in an underpass, we just clipped a Merc. <laughs> no harm done. Have you all seen that incredibly powerful commercial where every time a famous person clicks their fingers, a child dies? I was watching that, I couldn't help thinking, stop clicking your fingers. <laughs> I went out to dinner last night, I killed two kids just getting the bill. <laughs> For just a pound a day, you can feed a child in Africa. Sounds good, but I've checked, that's self-catering. <laughs> I saw a thing on a notice board recently. They're organising a parachute jump for people with Alzheimer's. <laughs> That's something that I'd pay to see. <laughs> That's basically euthanasia. <laughs> You're right, Grandad. You know what you're doing? <laughs> I fought in the war. <laughs> That's as maybe. <laughs> one, one thousand, two, one thousand. <laughs> are you my nephew? <laughs> Thank you.
I've done quite a few charity gigs over the past year. I did one in this very room. It's for a charity which I now know is called Laughter for Leukaemia. <laughs> Now, I'd had a long day and I turned up late and, you know, I made a mistake. I said, it's lovely to be here laughing at leukaemia. <laughs> Skinheads down the front didn't like it. <laughs> I was in Los Angeles last year. I did a gig for The Big Issue. They were relaunching The Big Issue out there and they'd organised this big sort of gala gig. They asked me to do five minutes. I said, it'd be my pleasure. And what they'd done, which I thought was quite interesting, they'd invited a lot of the homeless people along to the gig. So a whole section of the audience were homeless people, vendors of the big issue in Los Angeles. And I thought, what a brilliant thing, because you think hungry and homeless, but you don't think, you know, they could do with a night out. <laughs> night out's not the right phrase, but... <laughs> you get my drift. I walked out, I said, it's lovely to see so many bums on seats. <laughs> this didn't translate, really. This is the problem with doing charity gigs for other people. What you want to do is have your own foundation, your own kind of, you know, your own charity. That's the brilliant thing that kind of big A-list celebrities get to do. They get to have their own charity. I'd love to do that. Look at Michael Jackson. He's got his own charity, the Neverland Foundation. They fly sick children. What, good-looking sick children? <laughs> they fly good-looking sick children who look as if they could keep a secret <laughs> into the Neverland Ranch, and they give them massive cash payouts. <laughs> Valuable work. Who here, while we're on the topic, who here thinks Michael Jackson's innocent? Yeah. Yeah. Now, there are quite a lot of people here. Who are going to show hands? So hands? Hands right up in the air. Quite a lot of you think Michael Jackson's innocent. And do you know what? You've got morality on your side because he was found innocent by a jury of his peers. Albeit Americans, <laughs> still counts. I wouldn't have bothered with the whole trial. I just would have stood up in front of the jury and, and simply said this. If I was a billionaire paedophile, and I'm not, but if I was a billionaire paedophile, I definitely have a fun fair in my back garden. <laughs> he couldn't be any more dodgy if his house was made out of sweets. <laughs> Who here's got kids? Who here's got kids? You've got kids? You've got kids? Would you let them play at Michael Jackson's house? No? No. You would. You look like quite an old fella. How old are your kids? In their 20s. In their 20s, yeah. <laughs> would you have let your children play at Michael Jackson's house when they were about 12? No. No. For $10 million? <laughs> You'd have to think about it. <laughs> what I'd like to do is start a Jimmy Carr Foundation. Yeah? It's a good idea, isn't it? I'm only a, you know, I'm a D-list celebrity, but, you know, I could build and grow. I've got a couple of ideas for charities. I'd like to workshop them this evening. Good. <laughs> I'm glad you're so keen on the idea. <laughs> the first one, well, there's a terrible problem, a global problem, with amputeeism in sub-Saharan Africa because of all the landmines. Now, there's a lot of charities dealing with the landmine problem, you know, picking up the pieces there. <laughs> it's a bad choice of words, I know, but there's a lot of charities dealing with the landmines and clearing the landmines, but very few dealing with the residual problem of a lot of people with only one leg because the other one's been blown off. Yeah? That's a serious global problem. That almost looks too big to tackle. Yeah? But we in the West, we've got our problems too. Who here in this room can tell me that they don't have a problem with odd socks? <laughs> What I'm saying is, you take those two problems, <laughs> you put them together, what have you got? You've got a solution. Odd Socks for Africa, who's with me? <laughs> if there's one thing worse than having your leg blown off, it's the remaining foot being cold. <laughs> the next idea I've had for a charity is not quite as PC as all that. <laughs> Domestic violence. There's a topic for you. It happens, people don't like talking about it, but it happens in all our communities, yeah? Something needs to be done. There's a lot of charities dealing with the aftermath, very few doing anything preventative. I'd like to start a Jimmy Carr halfway house, a place where women can go and be safe and secure, and be re-educated about cooking and cleaning and putting out... <laughs> <laughs> Doesn't need to happen. There's nothing sad in the seeing a woman with two black eyes. She's been told twice, she just doesn't understand. 
You're looking slightly disapproving there, madam. You all right? I like the fact that you two look incredibly rock and roll in a sea of middle class. <laughs> what a wonderful thing. What, what do you do? Are you in a band or something? Me? Yeah. Uh, no, Called Cyber what? Cyber Dog. Cyber Dog? Yeah. Where do you think I got this? <laughs> hey? It's robber on the inside. <laughs> I might have a funky underpinning. <laughs> I don't know what a funky underpinning is. That's how unfunky I am. <laughs> Were you expecting more thrash metal at this gig? <laughs> yes, I'm sorry to disappoint. <laughs> and your, your partner there, so he, he's, you've got a similar look about you. What do you do, sir? I manage a fetish clothing shop. <laughs> you manage a fetish clothing shop? <laughs> Whereabouts? Uh, Cobb and Garden. Cobb and Garden? Yeah. It's a great spot for it. <laughs> What's the weirdest request you've ever had in the store? Um, someone wanted a douchebag fitted to a catsuit. Someone wanted a douchebag fitted to a catsuit? Yeah. They're all words I vaguely understand. <laughs> and yet, when you say them, what? <laughs> Hang on, what's a douchebag? It's a special uh, facility that can attach to the catsuit to defecate into them at will. <laughs> oh, a douchebag! <laughs> oh, I thought you said something else. Oh, right. The device I have on my cat suit so I can defecate at will. <laughs> Surely if you've got a cat suit on, you should really be going in the sandpit. <laughs> that's that's he's are you off to buy a <laughs> Did you did we just say defecate at will and you were off? <laughs> have you been hypnotized at some point? It's lovely to see so many ladies out this evening, especially a show starting at seven o'clock. The tea won't make itself. <laughs> <laughs> You're just staring, quietly judging. <laughs> yes, quite right. No. You look quite annoyed. I get it from him all the time. You get it from him all the time, do you? You lucky girl. <laughs> I bet you love it. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, it's in, it's in 1975. <laughs> what do you do? I um, work in a bookshop. You work in a bookshop? Is it an adult bookshop? <laughs> in the children's section. In the children's section of an adult bookshop. <laughs> <laughs> that is bad. <laughs> Did you know women reach their sexual peak after 35 years? Men reach theirs after about four minutes. <laughs> Which is why we get more done. <laughs> my girlfriend said to me, have you been having sex behind my back? I said, who the fucking hell do you think it was? <laughs> and another thing, it wouldn't kill you to turn around once in a while, check how I'm doing. <laughs> Are you all drinking this evening, ladies and gentlemen? Are you drinking? <coughs> Yeah, quite a few of you. I like drinking. I prefer being drunk than, than getting drunk. I'm not very keen on beer and wine, but I like the interesting things you order when you're drunk. The drinks that no one ever orders sober. Aftershock is a prime example. <laughs> you know that weird pink fluid? No one's ever ordered that. So the designated driver has never walked into a bar <laughs> and thought, well, I can have one drink, can't I? <laughs> they've got beer, they've got wine, they've got spirits. No. <laughs> I'll have a pipette of aftershock, please. <laughs> it's the same with the flaming Zambuca. No one's ever ordered one of those sober. And, yes, uh, yes. You have? Yes. You've ordered a flaming Zambuca sober? It's not a drink. It's your drink? Yes. You order flaming Zambucas? Yes. The clue as to why you shouldn't order one, madam, is the fact it's on fire. <laughs> it's the equivalent of walking into a kitchen going, I'm a bit thirsty, there's a glass and a tap, and then spotting out the corner of your eye, a gas hob. <laughs> the only reason I could possibly think of to order a flaming Zambuca when sober is if you meet a girl and she's something just a little bit special. Yeah? Maybe you've been out on two or three dates, you've established she's beautiful, she's intelligent, she's funny. You think you might be in love with her, you think she might be the one, but she's got a bit of a problem with facial hair on the top lip. <laughs> that can be an awkward thing to bring up. Much better, I think. 
take her out for a drink. <laughs> Two flaming Zambucas, please. <laughs> no, 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 they're both for you. <laughs> you know, and you drink flaming Zambucas as well. Where about you from? Newcastle. <laughs> oh, of course. Sorry, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm terribly sorry. I was just I was asking kind of a London audience, do you drink flaming Zambucas when sober? <laughs> I, if I thought there were people in from Newcastle, <laughs> I would have said, what do you like to drink to get you in the mood for a fight? <laughs> so what, are you down here on the Rob, or what are you up to? <laughs> so we sent you an email saying if you wanted to go out for drinks in Newcastle, we'd show you the better sites. The best sites in Newcastle? <laughs> I imagine the one where you go... Oh. <laughs> I know this isn't particularly PC, but I still can't forgive the Germans for the way they treated my granddad during the war. Passed over for promotion time and time again. <laughs> <laughs> On Remembrance Sunday, do spare a thought for the German ex-servicemen. At least our old soldiers are remembering winning. <laughs> now shit's their day out. <laughs> I was in Germany recently doing a comedy gig. I was flown out there to do one of these corporate gigs. I thought, comedy, Germany, it's missionary work. <laughs> Went out there, did, you know, did a comedy gig. The gig went fine, but on the way back, there was about a three-hour delay at the airport. Now I thought, that's not a problem, you know. I've got an iPod and a computer. I was quite, you know, busying myself. I was quite happy. The guy I was travelling with, the guy that organised the corporate gig, was livid with this three-hour delay. And he said, with no hint of irony, he said, yeah, say what you want about Hitler. <laughs> at least when he was around, the trains ran on time. <laughs> I thought, yeah, but think about where they were going. <laughs> I was in Edinburgh last year, I saw a sign in a window, it said, watch batteries fitted. <laughs> I thought it was probably not the best show on. <laughs> There's a sign up in my street saying the priorities of the traffic lights have changed. <laughs> There's another sign saying, children, please drive carefully. <laughs> I was driving on the motorway, I saw a sign on the back of a truck, a little sticker, said, how am I driving? I thought, well, if you don't know... <laughs> I've got a sticker on the back of my car. It says, keep your distance. I just need a little space right now. <laughs> it's not you, it's me. <laughs> You've got a question? No, I've got one of those, right? You've got one of those? In the curry house near where I live... Yeah. If you curry, you never get dressed up. <laughs> 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 that is fucking brilliant. Do you think they mean it to be like that? It's all right, I don't know if everyone heard. It was the, um, in the curry house near you live. It says, try one of our curries, you'll never get better. <laughs> that is fantastic. <laughs> I saw a sign in the park, it said, remove dog nuisance. So I shot a poodle. <laughs> I was in Australia, I saw a sign, it said, convenience store, 75 miles. Well, I'm not even going that way. <laughs> My favourite road sign of all time, it's a, it's a red triangle, and it says underneath falling rocks, and inside there's pictures of falling rocks. Hmm. What am I meant to do with that information? <laughs> it may as well just say random accidents ahead. <laughs> Life's a lottery, be lucky. <laughs> I think we've established so far, I'm not a prude, I don't mind talking about sex, and I certainly don't mind swearing. No problem with any of that. I'm genuinely offended by an advert that's on TV at the moment. It's for a brand of thrush treatment. It's Caniston or Gaveston, it's one of the two, I can't remember. Uh, which, which, one it, which one it is? Is it Caniston or Gaveston? Which one, sorry? Thank you, ladies with thrush. <laughs> the reason I'm offended by it is I just don't see the point. Who's watching that and thinking, this is a well-made commercial? I like the actors, I like the script, I like the sort of tagline at the end of the ad. I'm going to buy some of that. I don't have thrush, but I'm going to buy some. <laughs> or who's sitting there going... <laughs> that looks interesting, I might buy some of that. <laughs> I'm baking bread down here.
It's all very well going on a round-the-world trip on your holidays. Where are you going to go next year? <laughs> I had a survey done on my house. Eight out of ten people really rather liked it. If you're not part of the solution, you're a solid or a gas. <laughs> I was in a club last week. I saw a sign outside the cloakroom. It said one pound per item. So I bought a coat. <laughs> I was in a restaurant. I asked the waiter where the gents was. He said, just go down the stairs. Try our curries, you'll never get better. <laughs> Still having a bit of a giggle from that. My mother used to say, she was a very funny woman, my mother. She was a very kind of larger than life Irish lady. She used to say to me when I was little, she used to say, There are no strangers, just friends you haven't met yet. Don't talk to them. <laughs> my dad took me to one side on my 21st birthday. He said to me, he said, he said, Jimmy, the past is history. The future is a mystery. Right now is a gift. That's why it's called the present. I said, what, you didn't get me anything? Again? <laughs> a wise old man once said to me, he said, people never really listen, they're just waiting for their turn to talk. At least I think that's what he said. <laughs> I was driving through a very rough area of South London, I saw a big police sign by the side of the road, a big yellow and black thing. It said, violent crime here. <laughs> Tuesday. <laughs> 7.30. Can you help? I appreciate they're trying to bring communities together, but I don't even approve. <laughs> I had a thing happen to me a couple of weeks ago, actually, in North London, close to where I live. I was walking home about 11.30 at night, and this young kid, about 15 or 16 years of age, comes running out of an alleyway at high speed. He's all out of breath and panting and clearly in some distress. He says, help, help, me and my mate are being mugged. I said, all right, all right, calm down, take a breath. Of course I'll help. My mate and I are being mugged. <laughs> In the pursuit of scientific answers, animals have been tortured for the past 100 years. They're still not talking. <laughs> I'm starting to think they don't know anything. <laughs> I saw a brilliant bit of uh, medical research that's been done recently. They've come up with a new product. It's like, uh, like Viagra. It's like a Viagra inhaler that will give a man an erection within 30 seconds. Correct me if I'm wrong. A Viagra inhaler that will give a man an erection within 30 seconds. That's a blowjob. <laughs> Another company spent hundreds of thousands of pounds researching the Atkins diet and came to the conclusion that it can cause depression. Now, I could have told you that without any need for research. That's just deductive reasoning. Everyone knows fat people are jolly. <laughs> The British Medical Association are not above this kind of thing. They did some research saying irrefutably cigarettes can harm your children. Fair enough. Use an ashtray. <laughs> I worry about my nan. If she's alone in the house and she falls, does she make a noise? <laughs> I'm joking. She's dead. I do try and see the positive when something bad happens. You know, if somebody close to you dies, it's always a good idea. Move seats. <laughs> I remember when my nan was really ill in hospital, we went to visit her in Limerick in Ireland. Went over to see her and it was, you know, near the end. And the doctor came out and he said to us, he said, uh, he said, oh, no, she's, uh, she's very bad now. She, uh, she can't breathe without oxygen. <laughs> I thought, where did you get your medical degree? The internet? <laughs> All I'm saying is every cloud has got a silver lining. You can always see the fun in something, even if it's, you know, something tragic and terrible. You know, we've all been to funerals, haven't we? We've all been to a funeral at some stage. It's a very sad event. But, you know, every cloud has a silver lining. You know, and a, a relative, an elderly relative at death's door is a day off waiting to happen. <laughs> What's a funeral? It's about an hour. <laughs> Tends to be in the morning. The rest of the day is your own. I don't want you to judge me, ladies and gentlemen, but when my nana died, we went bowling. <laughs> Not immediately on hearing the news, <laughs> but that afternoon after the funeral, we went bowling. You know, life goes on. Not hers, obviously. <laughs>
She was in a box, on fire. <laughs> I was on fire. Three strikes. <laughs> old bit, I could see a couple of, a couple of kind of older gentlemen. How old are you, sir? You look a little bit older than... Yeah. 70. 70. Well, 70's quite old, I think. Yeah, nice to have you here, sir. Nice age range. What do you do? Nothing, man. Fine, well, you've, you've earned that, frankly. <laughs> Some of these fucking layabouts. <laughs> I bet it was different in your day, wasn't it? <laughs> 70, I bet you were loving the anti-German stuff, weren't you? <laughs> yeah, fuck them. Do you know what? PC or no PC, we won it fair and square. <laughs> the thing I was going to say was, I've been, I've been told this once, have you ever said to anyone, yeah, the problem with your generation, you think you invented sex? You ever said that to anyone? <laughs> no. Yeah, my granddad said it to me. He said, the problem with you lot, you think you invented sex. I said, all right, granddad. Have you ever fucked Nana up the arse, <laughs> pulled out and come on her tits? <laughs> Turns out he had, that's what killed her. <laughs> what? What's the matter with that? And don't you dare be offended by that, you know, by there being a 70 year old man. I bet you were crazy for it in the war. <laughs> Jesus, what? Well, there being a war on, I bet you got more poon tang <laughs> in those years. Yeah, we could all die tomorrow. Uh -huh. It's the best chat line in the world. <laughs> Who are you here with? She looks mortified. You all right? I'm glad. I can only apologise for the last bit of material about the... the granddad with the bum sex and the coming. <laughs> because I imagine what I've created is the longest journey home ever. <laughs> yeah, Dad, I enjoyed the show. Let's never talk again. <laughs> oh. <laughs> right, what else was I going to talk about? Um, it's 18 years since the Chernobyl disaster. Is it just me that's surprised? Still no superheroes. <laughs> Nothing. Not so much as a giant lizard. <laughs> Is anyone married in? Who's married? Yeah? yeah. yeah? And what's the longest someone's been married? Years. Two days. <laughs> two days? <laughs> Who's been married for two days? You got married on? Friday. On Friday? Well, congratulations. Well done, you. <laughs> and can I ask, is she pregnant or is this a proper one? <laughs> Sorry? I've done that already. You've, you already have a child? And now you got married? Yeah. Get out. <laughs> Get out of my house! <laughs> well, that's a lovely thing. Oh, well, congratulations. Thanks for coming. Wow! You know, you've married that guy. He looks like a great guy. He looks amazing. And clearly, he set the bar pretty low early on. <laughs> Where are we going on our honeymoon? We're going to see Jimmy Carr live. <laughs> Well, well done. You know, it, you know, good luck with it, is all I'm saying. Good luck. Because we all know a third of marriages end in divorce. <laughs> I don't want to put a damper on things, but a third of marriages end in divorce, and they're the lucky ones. The others are dying. <laughs> I'd rather go to jail than get married. I have thought this through, by the way. I'd rather go to the jail than get married. But, you know, if you murder someone, that's the worst thing you could do. You murder someone, you get a life sentence. You're out in 12 years. Hey! <laughs> Whereas this, life means life. <laughs> and in your average marriage, as opposed to prison, there is significantly less anal sex. <laughs> See if you think this is romantic. Really, I'm asking the ladies. Do you think this is romantic? I've got a friend, she's getting married at the end of the summer, and her fiancé has designed the wedding ring. He's quite a talented artist. Picked out the diamond when he was down in South Africa. Quite a talented artist, done sketches. Taken them to a jeweller in Hatton Garden who's putting the whole project together for him. That's romantic, isn't it, ladies? I think it almost makes up for the fact that she's clearly marrying a homosexual. 
she's going to have an amazing ring, not much of a wedding night. <laughs> I imagine it'll be something along the lines of, come to bed, darling. I'm just going to walk the dog in the park. <laughs> we don't have a dog. I'll be in the park. <laughs> While we're on the side, is anyone in favour of gay marriage? Who's in favour of gay marriage? Yes. You're by, by, by shouting out, who's in favour of gay marriage? Yes. I'll tell you why you're wrong. <laughs> gay marriage will inevitably lead to gay divorce, and that will be bitchy. <laughs> I'll tell you what happened to me recently. I was having a meeting in Mayfair in London. Walked out of the restaurant where we were having the meeting and I bumped into a guy settling the big issue. About 22, 23 years of age, and I got talking to him. I bought the big issue off him. I buy it, I don't read it. I don't mind the big issue, but you know, magazine for the homeless, there's not one advert for a flat. <laughs> They're not trying, are they? Anyway, got talking to this guy. I asked him what was going on in his life. He said, I'm looking for somewhere to live. I said, right. We're in Mayfair. <laughs> Did you not play Monopoly when you were a child? <laughs> you want to get yourself down the old Kent Road, mate? <laughs> it's not just an expression. Beggars can't be choosers. <laughs> I've got a cautionary tale for the men in the room. This concerns, you know, the kind of ability that men have got to say something immediately. They don't think about it, just walk straight out. Oh, I didn't know I'd said it. They kind of think it and then talk it exactly the same time. This happened to two friends of mine, Dave and Susan. They've been going out for years and years and years, 10 years since college. Susan went home for the weekend to see her parents. They had Sunday lunch together, they got a little bit tipsy over lunch. Nothing the matter with that, you would think. Lovely. All the way up to Hull to see them. Got drunk over Sunday lunch, somehow the topic of wife swapping came up. <laughs> and her parents, for a joke, said, oh, we were terrible for that back in the 70s. Oh, keys in a bowl at a party. Oh, terrible. Oh, always doing it. We don't know who your real dad is. <laughs> they said that to their daughter. <laughs> now, she was fine at the time because she was drunk at her lunch. But then on the train ride home, she starts to feel a bit grimy and horrible and, oh, oh, huh. Oh. <coughs> and eventually she works herself up into a real state. She thinks, well, maybe it was a joke on me. Maybe they were joking, but I was the butt of the joke. Maybe they did do that in the 70s. Maybe he's not my real dad. Oh, God. Oh, God. She got into Dave. And, of course, what Dave should have done is taken her in his strong, loving arms. Hey, it's just a silly joke. I'll pop the kettle on. I'll make you a cup of tea. I'll run you a bath. <laughs> that is what he should have done. But that's not what he did. That's not what he said. What he said, without skipping a beat... I've killed an African child. <laughs> but what he said, without skipping a beat, straight away... Uh, who got your mum? Tits or bum? Tits. Tits or bum? Bum. Tits or bum? Tits. Tits or bum? Tits. Tits or bum? Pex. Pex. Oh, yeah. You're not here for the jokes. Tits or bum? Tits. Clearly. Tits or bum? Bum. Tits or bum? Bum. Hmm. Every man in the room has now made their decision. Tits or bum. There's only two categories of men. We'll leave that for another day. There's two categories of men. Tits or bum. That's it. Every man in the room will have made their decision by now. You might be sitting next to someone you've been married to for 18 years. You might be thinking, well, actually, our relationship is a little bit deeper than just tits or bum. <laughs> We're best friends. There's a spiritual connection. It's been going, you know. It's a little bit more than just tits or bum. Mr. Funny Man. Whereas he'll be thinking, terrific norks. <laughs> the reason I mention it is because I've never heard a woman make that distinction. I've never once heard a woman say, yeah, cock, I could take or leave. <laughs> but a nice set of clangers. Oh. <laughs> when I was at school, if you got your right ear pierced, it meant you were homosexual. And if you got your left ear pierced, it meant you were common and you lived on an estate. <laughs> I had a friend when I was at school called Russell. Well, I say he was a friend. He was actually someone that just came and sat next to me when I was five on the first day of school and continued to hang around for the next 17 years. <laughs> inviting himself along to things and just generally being there and getting in the way. We've all got one of those, though, haven't we? If you're thinking, I haven't, it's you. 
And I'm not proud of this, but it happened. We were at a party, we got very drunk, we were about 16 or 17, and he got really drunk, Russell. He was kind of laid out drunk, passed out on the floor. And myself and my other friend, Anthony, we shaved his eyebrows off. He was really surprised. But you couldn't tell. <laughs> Does anyone in here work in the medical profession, by any chance? Yes. Yeah? What do you do? Ward sister. You're a what, sorry? Ward sister. A ward sister? Well done. That's a great job. I always wanted to work in the medical profession. I wanted to be a doctor. So did I. <laughs> well, maybe if you'd worked harder. <laughs> no, ward sisters are perfect. Yeah, it's a great job. It's a brilliant thing. But I always wanted to work in the medical profession because, you know, I liked the lab coat and I thought the stethoscope was cool and I thought chicks would like me. <laughs> chicks would like me. I'm not, I'm not quite sure what I was thinking. <laughs> but I, I could never become a doctor because I didn't have the chemistry or the maths or the physics you needed to get in. And also, I'm quite an uncaring person. <laughs> if someone's sick, I sort of think, fuck them. <laughs> but I think I found a hospital in South London where I'd be able to get a job. It's the Wandsworth Hospice for Incurable Diseases. <laughs> How tough could that be? <laughs> You'd stroll in about 11.30, chat up with a couple of nurses, you know, check what's for lunch. A patient would come up. Can you do anything, doctor? Did you not read the sign? <laughs> the only thing better than being a doctor, I think, would be to be a vet. I'd love to be a vet. Because vets are like doctors. They're admired in the community. Is there any, any vets in, by any chance? Are you, you're a vet. You're a student vet. You have picked a winner. <laughs> the great thing about being a vet, and you're just a student vet, but the, the great thing about being a vet is you've got the joker card you can play. If you absolutely have to be somewhere at 6.30, you can play the joker card. The big injection. If you can't work out what the problem is, or it's too much bother, whoop, gone. <laughs> that problem has gone away. <laughs> the veterinary surgery, the local vets, has got an incinerator out the back for a reason. <laughs> Because they're busy people. <laughs> I've never once heard a doctor say, yeah, your ten-year-old boy's had a good innings. <laughs> He's quite severely asthmatic. You know, we could keep him alive with pills and injections and whatnot, but it's quite expensive and a little bit messy. It'd <laughs> be much easier if I just put him off to sleep with this. <laughs> and vets always try and sweeten the deal as well, with the, I could take care of the body for you. Yeah, for £75. <laughs> it's a spaniel. I live next to a canal. You work it out. <laughs> it's got a strange thing with doctors and nurses, because I really do admire people in the medical community, because I don't have, you know, a god in my life, whatever. So, doctors and nurses are like secular gods. They bring us into the world, they let us, you know, take care of us when we're alive and let us die with dignity. It's an extraordinary thing. But I've never asked a doctor or a nurse about that. The only thing I've ever asked a doctor or a nurse about when I've met one, either socially or at a gig, is what's the weirdest thing you've ever pulled out of an arse? <laughs> well, I'm a gynaecology nurse, so we don't generally pull out that orifice. Really? Mm. You pulled anything interesting out of the other? Batteries, balls, pebbles, lots of pebbles. Sorry, hang on. <laughs> <coughs> Slow down. Batteries, corks, corks bottle tops, bottle tops pebbles. pebbles. Tops of hairspray cans. <laughs> that wasn't all one lady, was it? <laughs> if it was, do you have a number? <laughs> she sounds like she'd be up for anything. <laughs> wow, that's pretty grisly. I had a story recently from a nurse about, um, she said the weirdest thing she ever pulled out of an arse was a vibrator. Well, that's pretty plain vanilla, that's where they're meant to go. <laughs> she said the funny thing about it was when they, when they x-rayed him, it was still vibrating. That's awful, isn't it? For, for many reasons. I imagine the poor guy doing the x-ray was hitting the machine going... <laughs> this thing's on the fritz again, he's standing there. <laughs> what an agonising way in A&E, though. Excuse me, sir, could you turn off your mobile phone? <laughs> it's not a mobile phone. <laughs> well, what is it? I've got a prosthetic cock vibrating my ass. <laughs> As you were. I'm guessing from your laughter there you've pulled something weird out of your ass. No? There's definitely a story. <laughs> there definitely is. It just made you laugh. Yeah. Did it? What, when it came out or when you put it in? <laughs> Do you know what? We'll leave it. Do you all carry donor cards, Bloomsbury? Yeah. Clearly not. Well, you all should carry donor cards. It's a no-brainer. If you die and you're in reasonably good health, 
And I realise that's counterintuitive. <laughs> but if you die and you're in reasonably good health, you can help 70 people. 70, not just one or two, not just the major organs. They can take so much. They can harvest the body and help so many people. 70, they reckon. You should all get a donor card. The only thing I've written on my donor card is a clause in biro. <laughs> I've said I'd like all 70 things to go to the same person. Because <laughs> that way it's less of a donation, it's more a hostile takeover. <laughs> it's just me with new kidneys. <laughs> Hooray. <laughs> I went out to dinner with my girlfriend. Out of nowhere, she said, Would you still love me if I was a cripple? <laughs> I thought, hang on. That's a silly question. I'd leave if you put on half a stone. <laughs> Obviously, I didn't say that. I said, yeah, I'd prefer it. <laughs> Here's a piece of advice for you. you. Never leave electrical goods plugged in overnight. Two exceptions, fridges and life supports. <laughs> You'll waste an awful lot of vegetables. That was a bit harsh, we better do something a bit lighter. <laughs> it's ironic that people with club feet tend not to be very good dancers. <laughs> Has anyone here read Stephen Hawking's Brief History of Time? Yes. Did you understand it all? No. Well, fair enough, I understood about half of it. I think that's pretty good going, though, when you consider he wrote it with a straw. <laughs> Cut him some slack, there's bound to be some typos. <laughs> now I've got no problem doing jokes about disability. It's fine, it's just wordplay, there's no prejudice in it, there's no malice. I would tell the same jokes if there was someone in with any of the conditions. But I heard a brilliant story about a comic who did something truly, truly terrible. He was doing a gig, turned up to the theatre, quite a well-known, quite a famous comic, turned up to the theatre, I can't tell you his name, but he was quite a famous sort of TV comedian, turns up to the theatre, refuses to go on. They say, why won't you go on? He's looked on from the wings, he spotted that the front row is full of people in wheelchairs. He said, I'm not going on. They said, why, why won't you go on? He said, well, a lot of my act is banter with the front row. I, I tease and, you know, pick on the front row. I don't feel comfortable with it. I'm not going on. They said, what? What? I can't believe it. He drove off. He just left. I thought, Jim. <laughs> Jim. They're making it easy for you. <laughs> what is it about being blind that makes you want to walk the dog the whole time? <laughs> Say what you want about the death. <laughs> There's a company in America now making thongs, you know the item of underwear, size 26 and over. That's big, isn't it? I just question, is it necessary? I think any pair of knickers oversized 20 is a thong within four steps. <laughs> We're all familiar with the hungry bum syndrome. <laughs> I saw a woman earlier on the street, looked like she was chewing a toffee. <laughs> <laughs> I've discovered, gentlemen, the worst thing you can say when your girlfriend says to you, does my bum look big in this, is not yes. The worst thing you can say is, let me step back, get it all in. <laughs> My girlfriend used to get annoyed with me because I used to leave the toilet seat up, so I don't do that anymore. Always, always put it down. Because yeah. it's a woman that I love and I want to spend the rest of my life with. It's only a little thing, but a little means a lot. Yeah. Hmm. Of course, there's no winning with her. Now she's annoyed because it's covered in piss. <laughs> They say, don't masturbate, you'll go blind. Yeah, only if you get it in your eyes. <laughs> Aim away. Who do you think about when you masturbate? <laughs> Her. So do I, she's lovely. <laughs> that was a good answer. You think about your partner when you masturbate. I think I put my hand on my heart, speak on behalf of every man in here and say, when we masturbate, we think about you ladies. We think about our partners, our wives and our girlfriends. Yeah. We think, <laughs> we do. I do, I always think of my girlfriend. I think, Ocean's walk in. <laughs> She doesn't even know I've got these magazines. <laughs> I'd like to end by talking about threesomes, because it tends to divide the sexes. Most men would be quite up for a threesome with two girls. Most women don't really fancy that action. If you're asked to bring a friend, you tend to get a little bit offended. And I think it's because men are such bad communicators. 
You know, when we ask for that, women sort of hear, oh, what, I'm not enough woman for you, you need two women to satisfy you because you're such a big man. That's not what we're saying, ladies. What we're saying is, wouldn't it be brilliant if after sex there was someone there for you to talk to? <laughs> so, Jimmy Carr, thank you very much indeed. Cheers. Good night. Thank you. Thanks very much. I'm never quite sure how to take an encore. I'm, I'm never quite sure what it means. It either means we've had a lovely time with just like a few more minutes, or 17 pounds for that, you're having a fucking laugh. <laughs> Shall I tell you what this is like, ladies and gentlemen? Yeah. It's very much like after talking to you for about an hour, it's like being at a dinner party and realising you're the only one on cocaine. <laughs> you find yourself thinking, they're not a very chatty bunch. <laughs> If it wasn't for me, this would be shit. <laughs> I was going to tell you a story about a gig I did recently. I did a gig for Mojo magazine. It's a big, you know, pop magazine. And uh, did a gig. It all went well. I was doing their award show for them. They invited me on. They said, yeah, will you do our awards? I said, my pleasure. Lovely. Lots of rock stars and rock chicks would be cool. There was the awards there. I was just doing sort of ten-minute stand-up to begin with. I told a slightly anti-American joke. I said, of course, in Britain, we've got to eat as much as you like restaurants, whereas in America, you've got to eat as much as you can. <laughs> you've added that important ingredient, competition. <laughs> so not only could you be enjoying a delicious meal, you could be beating a personal best. <laughs> Thus, the necessity for three pockets on the back of your jeans, you fat fucks. <laughs> and a voice from the back of the room shouted, fuck off! I thought, I presume you're American, are you? He said, yes. I said, think of it as friendly fire. <laughs> He then shouted, fuck off again, but louder. I thought, well, I'd better deal with this. I said, I'm sorry, ladies and gentlemen, the only reason I got into comedy and doing this kind of thing is because I thought it would be a bit of a fanny magnet. I wasn't expecting a cunt like that. <laughs> At which point, the editor of Mojo magazine, who was sitting just down here, got up and looked like he was going to come around and pull me off. <laughs> Not like that. <laughs> that was funny. Well done. <laughs> no, no, you go ahead. <laughs> I sort of signalled to him to stop. <laughs> I signalled to him to stop. I said, I'm sorry, sir, it was, a, it was a cheap shot. It's a bullseye, it doesn't matter. <laughs> and I apologise unreservedly, sir. I did not mean to. Well, I mean, the thing was, the, the line got a laugh, but then there was a big, there was an audible, ooh. I thought, well, who have I told to fuck off? It was a guy called Anthony Kiedis. <laughs> who's the lead singer of the Red Hot Chili Peppers. <laughs> and I'd noticed on the way in that he was on the cover of Mojo magazine, and I wasn't. <laughs> I thought, this is a social faux pas of epic proportions. <laughs> uh, you know, and I thought, well, I better apologise unreservedly. I said, I am sorry. If I've caused any offence, I'm sorry. I did not mean to call you a cunt. I'm sure you're not. I'm sure you don't have the depth or the capacity to give pleasure. <laughs> I'd say comfortably, four minutes later, I was presenting him with a Lifetime Achievement Award. <laughs> A chicken that has had its head chopped off can run the entire length of a football pitch before it dies. That's what I call an opening ceremony. <laughs> My girlfriend used to think that magazines like Zoo and Nuts and FHM and Maxim were pornographic, till she found my real stash. <laughs> Obviously, I mean, it goes the other way too. You know, men are no good at stopping and asking for directions. Would you agree with that, ladies? Uh, yeah. yeah, men are no good at stopping and asking for directions. Of course, on the other hand, maybe we wouldn't have to, if you could read a fucking map. 
I've got no problem buying tampons. I'm a fairly modern man. But apparently they're not a proper present. <laughs> Happy birthday, Mum! <laughs> Listen, thank you very much for coming out. You've been a great audience. Thank you. Cheers. Good night. <laughs> thank you very much.